Today's presentation is going to cover strategies to control listeria with a focus on um, strategies for industry to prevent listeriosis contamination and outbreaks. The take home messages I want you to have at the completion of this um, seminar is number one related to the biology of listeria. It's important to realize that listeria monocytogenes, even though it causes severe disease, it requires high levels of listeria to make a person sick. This is practically important because it leads us to an intervention strategy. If the products we produce don't allow growth or are reformulated for reduced listeria growth or, or are stored in a way to reduce listeria growth, the risk of a human disease case or outbreak can be much reduced. The second practical and very important thing I hope you will realize at the end of this presentation is that virtually all listeria monocytogenous issues that lead to cases and outbreaks are linked to contamination that originates from processing plant environments. In order to address this, it is, clear, it is essential that food processing facilities have pathogen environmental monitoring programs and properly designed sanitation programs in order to prevent listeriosis cases and outbreaks. So cleaning and sanitation are key. Environmental monitoring programs are important, but most important are the actions taken after positive listeria is found in a facility. Here's what I'm gonna walk through today. I'm gonna to start out with some background on listeria. Um, in the US, listeria causes about 1,300 human cases a year, about 250 deaths a year. So it is a severe disease and a, a disease that happens regularly throughout the world. As you know, the symptoms are severe. One of the key challenges in the public health arena is that it take that listeria has a long incubation period. It can take up to 60 days between consumption of a food and human disease which then makes it difficult to pinpoint the specific foods that may be responsible for a case on outbreak. I wanna illustrate the point I made about listeria requiring high doses to cause disease. Some estimates that were published suggested that a person needs to consume 10 billion, and I repeat, 10 billion listeria in a single serving, and if that person is pregnant, she will have a one in about 600 to 700 chance of getting listeriosis. Now, these numbers aren't necessarily absolute truths, but it gives you an idea that foods need to have high, high levels of listeria to cause cases and to cause an outbreak as big as what's currently seen in South Africa. How can that occur? It can occur because listeria can grow at refrigeration temperatures and can grow reasonably fast, particularly if the refrigeration temperature is not four to six degrees centigrade, but is seven degrees centigrade or higher. The other challenge with listeria and the biology is that this organism is common in many environments and therefore is easily introduced into food processing plants. However, and this is important to remember, standard pasteurization treatments, heat treatment kills listeria very, very effectively. So contamination usually in ready to eat product occurs after the heat treatment step. So this leads us to control strategy number one, prevent listeria growth in high-risk products. Two key strategies, number one is make sure foods are properly refrigerated. Abusage temperature, so higher temperature during storage, seven degree, 10 degree centigrade, et cetera, significantly increases the risk of, a, of high numbers, which then means a person is much more likely to get sick. To illustrate, an estimate for the U.S. suggested that if all products in the U.S. that have been linked to listeriosis were stored at four degrees or below, we would have less than 10 cases rather than 1,300. The second strategy that has been effectively used is to reformulate products to reduce the ability of listeria to grow. That's been particularly done in ready-to-eat meats in the U.S., so sliced deli meats, etc., which have been formulated with lactate and diacetate, which reduces growth, and that most likely has considerably contributed to reducing listeriosis cases in the US. If anything industry can do to reduce listeria growth, will make major contributions to reducing the risk of cases and another outbreak. Important, I wanna remind everyone that listeria is more than listeria monocytogenous. Listeria monocytogenous is the pathogen that causes human disease, 
but there are a number of other Listeria species, such as Listeria innocua, Listeria saligari, as well as 11 other species that have been described since 2010. This is important because testing in food processing plants of the environment often uses Listeria species. So we're looking for Listeria species, not for Listeria monocytogenous, because if we find Listeria species in an environmental monitoring program, it suggests conditions where Listeria could monocytogenous could reside, where Listeria monocytogenous could be a problem. So when we find Listeria, we react as if it were Listeria monocytogenous and put in place control strategies to not allow Listeria monocytogenous to grow or survive in these spots. So that's why it's important to realize that Listeria species are there and are used as an indicator. Our understanding of Listeria and Listeriosis, as also witnessed in the current outbreak in South Africa, has tremendously changed with the use of DNA fingerprinting tools and specifically whole genome sequencing tools. I want to give you an illustration of what these tools look like. So even when we have isolates of Listeria monocytogenous obtained from foods or humans, if we apply DNA fingerprinting tools, we can find differences. We can find that the Listeria on top is different from the one on the next line, is different from one on the next line. And in this case, we see banding patterns, which is a common fingerprinting method that was used until a few years ago for Listeria. And with these, these tools, we can fingerprint Listeria from human cases. We can see that two humans are infected with the same fingerprint of Listeria. We can then interview those people, find a common food they consumed, hopefully find the food, test it. And if we find Listeria monocytogenous from that food, we can fingerprint the Listeria monocytogenous from the food compared to the human. And if the food fingerprint of Listeria is the same as the human fingerprints, we have a fairly convincing case that this food caused these human cases, if supported by epidemiology. These tools have le led to detection of a number of outbreaks worldwide, including the US. One of the biggest ones, but not the biggest ones, was one with 108 cases, 14 deaths, and four miscarriage of stillbirth in the US. And this one is important because it brings us back to control strategies. This facility that caused this listeriosis outbreak had an appropriate HACCP plan. It was a USDA inspected facility. Their kill step, their heat treatment worked perfectly. It killed listeria monocytogenes in the raw material, but contamination occurred after the critical control point from the environment. That environmental contamination occurred over months, probably years, and was enough to contaminate enough foods to make 108 people sick. And that's in a plant that is USDA inspected and did some environmental testing. So it illustrates how devastating environmental contamination can be with regard to human listeriosis outbreaks. And this is a similar scenario is most likely what is occurring in South Africa right now. Now, the fingerprinting tools we used have changed. We don't use banding patterns anymore, but we now use or genome sequencing. And what that does simplistically is it looks at all 3 million A, C, Ts, and Gs that represent the Listeria genome and uses that as a fingerprint. I took a small snippet of these 3 million here to show you how it works. With these tools, we can see that Listeria isolate one is different from isolate two because one has an A, the other one has a T. And we can also see that one is different from four T instead of a G, A instead of a T. Listeria with different sequences are assigned sequence types, STs. So this Listeria could be ST1, this one would be ST2, ST1 again, ST3, because they're different. So much more powerful fingerprinting tool because we don't rely on 10 to 12 bands, but we take all 3 million ACTs and Gs. These tools have been used routinely in the US and other countries for almost five years. So since 2013, every human, every food, Listeria monocytogenous isolate in the US has been characterized by these DNA fingerprinting tools. The impact of these tools has been tremendous and is shown here. The yellow bars indicate 
human listeriosis outbreaks. So you can see we had an outbreak in 83, one in 85, one in 89, one in 94. And these are outbreaks in the US. One outbreak every three years, the average size of an outbreak, 70 cases. So big, but nothing as big as what you experience now. Starting in 97, we see an outbreak detected every year, anywhere from one to five. So it's a considerable increase from pre-97. What happened? This is when routine DNA fingerprinting, with banning patterns, these barcodes started. In 2013, we started whole genome sequencing. With whole genome sequencing, we detect seven to eight outbreaks a year. South Africa is still in the pre-fingerprinting stages here. Rare outbreaks, but very large outbreaks. Yours is, of course, much larger. But one of the consequences of these outbreaks will likely be increased use of fingerprinting tools, where we will then move into what we see here. More outbreaks, more outbreaks linked to food industry. So the food industry needs to prepare now because we will see increased scrutiny in South Africa with regard to this pathogen. Now, these same tools of DNA fingerprinting also have helped us better understand sources of listeria and how to control listeria. This is an example of some work we did in a processing facility. This, in this case, was a smoked seafood plant. We visited that plant over multiple visits, one, two, three, and visits four and five were not shown. Every time we visited that facility, we collected samples from product, raw material, and the environment. When we found Listeria monocytogenes, we fingerprinted the Listeria monocytogenes. So the first thing you can see is that we find different fingerprints of Listeria monocytogenes. One here, another one here, and you can see that there are multiple fingerprints. But more importantly, there's one fingerprint of Listeria monocytogenes that we found on the first visit. It's marked with a star and called 1039C. The second visit, five, six weeks later, we find the same fingerprint, about six or seven samples. The next visit, another five to six weeks later, we find the same fingerprint in eight samples. Every time we visit that facility, we find the same Listeria monocytogenes in the environment and on different products. Products made from raw materials that came as far apart as Alaska and Norway. So, Raw material comes from 1,000 miles apart, goes into the plant, is contaminated with the same Listeria monocytogenes fingerprint that is found in the facility. Pretty clear indication that contamination happens in this facility, but more importantly, pretty clear indication that this Listeria monocytogenes subtype or fingerprint survived in this facility over all five visits. I didn't show you four and five, but we found that fingerprint at those visits too. This now leads us to an, another way of how to represent environmental monitoring results. This is another processing facility where we sampled raw product for Listeria monocytogenes. We took samples from the raw area where raw materials are received. We took samples from the finished product area. We took samples from food contact surfaces and we took samples from finished product. Every time we found Listeria monocytogenes, we fingerprinted it, and for this chart, we coded Listeria monocytogenes with the same fingerprint with the same color. So you can see in the raw area, the fingerprint shown in green is found multiple times. It's found in the first visit, so these are monthly visits, not visit two and three, found again visit four, not five, found again six. So we find the same fingerprint over 12 months, sporadically, but predominantly in the raw area. But we don't find it in one place every time. So this suggests Listeria monocytogenes of this green fingerprint is surviving in this raw area. It may be introduced from raw materials over and over again, but most likely it's surviving in the raw area over time in a place that we're not yet sampling because if we would find the place, we would find this green fingerprint every time. Importantly, what we can also see is, even though this Listeria is mainly found in the raw area, it also showed up once in the finished product area. Interestingly, on a door handle, suggesting some sort of movement of people 
that is moving this listeria from the raw area into the finished area. Now we did more sampling over the next year to try to find the place where this listeria is hiding. And you can see that we had multiple sampling sites where every time we sampled, we found the same fingerprint of Listeria monocytogenes. That means this Listeria survived in this facility over two years, and we found the place where it survives. And over those two years, it continued to repeatedly move into the finished product area, found here, found here twice, and moved as far as food contact surfaces. So we found this fingerprint on a, of Listeria on a slicer, so it's moving around throughout the facility, suggesting GMPs, sanitation, are not followed and performed properly. So where did this Listeria survive? In this case, we found the Listeria monocytogenes survived in a floor mat. This is not the exact floor mat that we found in this facility, but these were old floor mats. They were thick, they were about three, four centimeters thick, Sanitation consisted of either foaming them with sanitizer or submerging them, but the floor mats were too thick, had too many cracks, so Listeria that was inside the floor mat was protected from sanitizer, and the floor mats were put back on the floor. At the beginning of processing, Listeria was in it, person stepped on it, and that pressure of that weight brought the Listeria back into the facility. So we threw out all the floor mats in this facility, replaced it with shoes that had, were soft and had cushioning, never found this Listeria monocytogenes in this facility again, after it lived there for, four, for two years at least. So this illustrates the idea of gross niches. It's not about floor mats or only about floor mats. It is about places where Listeria can survive routine sanitation. And this is, one of the major issues with regard to listeria control. Processing facilities with equipment that is not properly designed, processing facilities in plants, in buildings that are not designed for cleaning and sanitation. Listeria finds places where it survives sanitation and then continues to contaminate food. Not every product, it's sufficient if it contaminates one, two, five percent of products produced and then some of these products allow growth, and with growth of Listeria monocytogens, we have high enough numbers to then cause an outbreak like the one you re receiving, you currently see. So that is the most likely scenario what we're seeing right now. Some facility has Listeria ST6 in it. It's living there, it's growing there, it's contaminating food every day. The food it contaminates allows growth, particularly if it's not properly stored, and it's then consumed and causes these cases. That's the facility we need to find. This example is another gross niche. It's a hollow roller. You see a conveyor belt. You see a roller. You see a crack. Listeria and water can come in through the crack. Sanitizer does not get inside this roller. But when the roller rolls for eight hours, Listeria that's inside the roller will come back out, contaminate the roller, contaminate the conveyor belt. One way to deal with this issue would obviously be to design different rollers or to take the rollers and heat treat them completely. If you don't believe me that this is an issue, here's a look inside the roller. You can see dirt, because obviously the roller has not been taken apart. Even if some sanitizer comes in, the dirt will protect the listeria. It's not just rollers, it's hollow equipment. Every processing facility will have tens, if not hundreds of places where listeria monocytogenes could survive sanitation. We continue to need to find them, fix them, and improve our sanitation procedures to control listeria. This is not just contamination events. Here's an outbreak in Finland, 25 cases, six deaths. The most likely source here was the screw conveyor in the butter wagon. Difficult to clean piece of equipment, unusual food. Food, people wouldn't necessarily look at butter because we think it would not support growth, but apparently if the water droplets in butter are big enough, there is the possibility for some growth of listeria. So these sort of issues of persistent listeria contamination and survival in the plant lead to outbreaks, and virtually all outbreaks have been linked to persistence of listeria in a facility. This illustrates how extreme it can get. These are two 
a case of listeriosis in 1988 in the US, an outbreak in 2000, 12 years, same Listeria monocytogenous. That Listeria monocytogenous survived in this processing plant over 12 years. The plant changed the products it made, changed the management, it was owned by a different company in 2000 and 1988, but the Listeria survived in that facility for 12 years. And that is not unusual. So that leads us to how do we use this information to reduce and better control Listeria? And the key part here is to know where in your environment of your food processing plant Listeria is. How do you do this? Through environmental pathogen monitoring programs or environmental sampling programs. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to these programs, but you know the time given to me is not sufficient to train you to do this. I will also give you some resources, but this is a key need for the food industry in South Africa and anywhere in the world. Understand how to implement better environmental monitoring programs and how to act on the results to reduce listeria contamination and prevent listeria from living in your facility over time. Here's conceptually how this works. And this is called the listeria equation by industry in the US and elsewhere that have used this and, and the different versions of it. The basic idea is that we have multiple strategies that should control listeria. Separation of raw from ready to eat, good manufacturing practices, sanitary facility and equipment design, effective cleaning sanitation procedures. But only if we have an environmental pathogen monitoring program that checks whether these things work properly do we have an effective pathogen control program. So environmental monitoring is key to make sure we do what we need to do to control listeria. In the examples I've shown you, our environmental pathogen monitoring program showed us that we don't have proper sanitary equipment design, that we don't have effective cleaning and sanitation, that we don't have good GMPs because people move around the facility and move listeria around. So the goals of an environmental monitoring program can be separated into a couple of different areas. Number one is verification samples, sampling. You collect samples in your facility to verify food safety procedures, such as cleaning, sanitation, et cetera. Another goal of it is what one could call preventive control investigation or sampling for validation. This is to specifically identify problem areas and to validate whether preventive controls or sanitation procedures work. One idea here is to use intensive sampling on a piece of equipment to make sure that your sanitation operating procedures, your SSOPs, your standard sanitation operating with it, work to properly sanitize a piece of complicated equipment to eliminate listeria at the end of each day. Typical environmental monitoring programs are organized to cover different zones of a facility. Typically, these are called zone one to four, but that differs by country. I think New Zealand has three zones, uh, et cetera. But the basic principle is the same. You need to separate your facility into zones, with one zone being product contact surfaces, zone two, the next zone being areas near the contact surfaces where the product that has undergone heat treatment contacts the food, but it's near. Zone three, other areas in the finished product room, and then zone four are areas outside the ready to eat room. That could be loading docks, could be locker rooms, could be where people move in. Typically, most of your environmental monitoring will focus on zone twos and threes, 70, 80% of samples there, five to 10% of samples taken from zone four, Zone one, big difference. Some facilities might not sample zone one at all because they feel like they can control the hazard with zone two or three sampling. But I recommend at least some zone one sampling. Um, some facility might take up to 10, 20% of their samples in zone one. It also depends on the regulatory environment, how your regulatory agency interprets a zone one positive, as it interprets it as a food positive, then implicating that the food is positive or not, so there are a lot of considerations getting into this that you need to work out before you start a program. But you need a program and you need to think of your facility in terms of zones. In addition to making sure you sample the different zones, you need to make sure you sample different functional areas. You sample niches. 
We talked about hollow rollers, hollow table legs, floorboard junctures, cracks in the floors, etc., are essential and need to be sampled. These are the places where Listeria can survive. You also need to sample transfer points, door handles, high traffic areas, to help you understand whether Listeria is being moved around. And if it is, that suggests some challenges with your GMPs. One key thing that is a continuous challenge for industry in the US and worldwide is that people do environmental monitoring, but they don't sample correctly to find listeria. Sometimes because they don't want to find listeria because it could have negative impacts on business, it could mean more work, and sometimes simply because they're not trained well. I'm gonna illustrate the challenge with this picture here. So this is a typical situation you find in a reasonably good plant you have a metal board, you have tile, you have a crack in between. It's essential that you sample this crack in between here, not just a clean flat surface after sanitation. You'll not find anything on the clean flat surface in most times, particularly if you sample after sanitation. But if you sample that crack, put a sponge deep inside, you will find, you're much more likely to find listeria and problems. So how do you collect samples? The key is to use sponges, so you can sample large areas. We rarely use Q-tips or swabs. We can't sample effectively enough. Some guidance for sampling will guide you towards sampling certain areas, 30 by 30 centimeters, 12 by 12 inches. Some people even have seen pictures of a template. This is not the correct way of doing it. In this case, we sample a flat surface, we have a template that might cross-contaminate, and we should really use a sponge to sample the cracks around the corners where we're most likely to find problems. So don't use this approach. Use sponges, sample large areas. Do not focus on 30 by 30 centimeters because that directs you towards flat surfaces. Sample cracks, sample different to find areas. How often do you test? Depends on your facility, depends on the risk. Some facilities sample every day, some sample weekly, some sample monthly. Many facilities have a large list of sites that should be sampled, but only collect sa samples from some sites every week. Might be 75 to 100 sites and randomly 30 are picked. It's very difficult to give guidance in terms of how many sponges to take, but some guidance, and this is rough, is one sponge per 150 square meters of processing facility per week has been recommended. What does that mean? If you have a 1,500 square meter facility and you collect one sponge, you're low. If you have a 1,500 square meter facility and you collect five to 10 sponges, you're in the ballpark of what you need to do to understand whether listeria is an issue in your facility and where it is. When to test, not an important one. Pre-op, so testing after cleaning and sanitation, less likely to find listeria but it's easier to interpret. If I find listeria after sanitation, I know where it is and where it um, survives sanitation. So pre-op testing or testing after sanitation is good for validating SSOP, Sanitation Standard Operating Procedures, but it's not a good way as a routine verification testing. A routine verification test, the test you do every week, the sampling you do every week, should occur mid-op. During operation, some countries say at least four hours after start of production, that is more likely to yield positives. It shows you if there are problems more easily, but when you find positives, that may not be the place where the listeria survives because it might've been moved around the facility. So if you have a positive side, you have to follow up with more testing and that testing might include testing before cleaning, after cleaning and before sanitation to find out where is the listeria surviving in my facility. Now the key is that environmental monitoring is not what makes food safer. It's not what reduces the risk for my business. It's what we do with the results. Environmental monitoring results need to drive corrective actions. So that's fix the problem that I discovered, but also need to drive and importantly need to drive what we call preventive actions actions that prevent a similar or same problem from occurring somewhere else in another facility, in another piece of equipment on another corner of my plant. So if you have a positive sample in your environmental monitoring, the first thing is to do 
vector swabbing, we sample around it to find out where this listeria might be hiding, where is the niche, but then you also need to do a root cause analysis and you need to have formal procedures for root cause analysis. What is the problem? Is it we're not sanitizing right? Is it we have a good sanitation protocol, but the employees are not following it? Is the problem that we have equipment that cannot be cleaned, et cetera, et cetera. We have to follow up on a positive with deep cleaning. So to clean the equipment that we identified as the likely source to hope to eliminate Listeria, and we need to check that by further sampling. But, and this is important, the last bullet, the preventive actions must go beyond deep cleaning and root cause analysis. A good program will lead to changes in cleaning and sanitation procedures, may change how much we disassemble an equipment every day so that we can clean it everywhere. A good environmental monitoring program will drive changes in mass sanitation schedules. So this is equipment that is not sanitized every day, but every week, every month, every six months. Our environmental monitoring program might show us where we need to do more frequent sanitation. It will show us which equipment need to be maintained better, where we're missing our preventive maintenance program, not changing pieces of, of the equipment such as gaskets often enough so the steer can find niches where it survives. We're not changing floor mats often enough. And it will help us identify equipment that has to be modified or even has to be replaced because it's simply uncleanable. Here are some examples of what that looks like. So on the left side, you see a conveyor belt. It looks nice and clean, but these strips are difficult to clean. The ro roller is hollow, difficult to clean here, difficult to clean here. Ultimately, it will be replaced with an easier to clean conveyor belt and easier to clean rollers. Another idea, if we see equipment with welding, like on the left side, you see small cracks, Listeria can go in here, can go in here, can go in here. It can hide there. Sanitizer will not reach it effectively. These things need to be redesigned to be clean and smooth surfaces like shown on the right side. But it also means we need to train the people in our plant that do equipment maintenance, that do welding, to not do weld like this, but provide nice and clean welds and set up the equipment and repair the equipment in a way that it stays cleanable and becomes cleanable. Another example of what a good environmental monitoring program should find, interfaces of metal with plastic. In addition to hollow areas, hollow legs, hollow framework, are a major hiding place for Listeria. Plastic metal interfaces are a constant challenge. You can see that there's obviously plastic and metal interface, there's a small crack, Listeria can live in here. The sanitizer will not move in here with routine sanitation, but the conveyor belt goes over it for eight hours, we have vibration, Listeria that's hiding in this interface will be removed, will come out, will contaminate the conveyor belt. How do we fix this? Short term, we have to take these pieces apart, maybe not every day, maybe just weekly, and clean and sanitize it. If it hit, we find we will kill the Listeria and hit the Listeria with sanitizer that are hiding here. And then we design the equipment. And then, of course, a good environmental monitoring program will lead us to problem areas in the floor, drains that are difficult to clean and sanitize, cracks in the floors, problems with floor wall junctures, etc. And that leads us to where we need to improve sanitation and where we may have to fix infrastructure problems in the facility. This was an introduction to um, environmental monitoring program. There is a free resource that I've recorded um, and that is available on the web. It's uh, five parts, um, each of them about 30, 40 minutes on environmental monitoring for those of you who are interested in more details. So we're back to the take home messages and, and I'm gonna re-emphasize what industry can do. Number one, do whatever you can do to make sure your products support minimal growth of listeria. Make sure it's stored in a proper refrigeration. There is limited temperature abuse. Have clear instructions for people to store it appropriately. You might even want to think about time temperature indicators that indicate to a customer if a food's been temperature abused, not stored properly. And, redes and redesign, reformulate your product to reduce growth if you can. 
Second one is processing plants are a key source of listeria. Implement a pathogen environmental monitoring program and use it to drive a properly designed and implemented sanitation program. Cleaning and sanitation is key. You need to have good cleaning and sanitation programs to prevent listeriosis. And you need to have fat sanitary facility and equipment design. It's not the sampling which makes a difference, it's the action you take afterwards. And this also brings us back to, you know, what I think the source of the South Africa listeriosis outbreak likely is. It likely is a facility with persistent listeria that produces a food that allows for listeria growth. This does not mean every product, every package of product comes out of that facility has listeria in it. It's sufficient to have two to 5% of products contaminated to cause an outbreak, even as big as this one is. This is what I had. I hope this provides some useful information that can help you translate, that you can translate in your food facilities, reduce the risk of listeriosis and hopefully help you find and control the current outbreak. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me by email. Thank you. Bye-bye.